He kōna e pūrangi tēnei nā te reo irirangi o Aotearoa. They say life is stranger than fiction. If you have Octayon around, it sheds some of its magic. So that's similar to how if you have a radioactive material, it's shedding alpha particles, beta radiation, gamma radiation. But sometimes what we see in movies or read in books is so incredible that it obviously couldn't be possible. Or could it? There's a civilization that's made light reservoirs that are made out of silica. And this means that they can like trap the light. So that I just thought that was like a handy little nod to um, to solar panels. I'm Brian Crump and welcome to Sci-Fi Sci-Fact. To the world of Terry Pratchett, disc world and the material octiron, at least that's how my guest says it. Her name is Kate Andrew. She's a student in optical nano micro robotics, which sounds like a story in itself, at Massey University, where she's supervised by two McDiamond Institute investigators. She's also part of the student led McDiamond Emerging Scientists Association. A little bit of Discworld to kick us off. Many years ago, we arranged for one of our number to hide in your head. Who are we? Exactly. We are the seven spells, and our task is to see that nothing dreadful happens to the eighth rinse wind. It is most important that you don't let the wizards take the spell from you. All eight spells must be said at the right time, or terrible things will happen. And they mustn't be said by the wrong people. The wizards. Precisely. Am I in the octave? In certain metaphysical respects, yes. <laughs> why are you screaming? Yes, why are you screaming? I'm inside a bloody book talking to voices I can't see. You ask me why I'm screaming? Octiron. That's how you say it, but uh, how do you play it? What does it do? So... Um, to explain Octayon, I'm just going to give a quick introduction to the Discworld first. So if you're unfamiliar with Terry Pratchett, the Discworld is a fantasy disc-shaped world that travels through space-time on the back of four cosmic elephants, which in turn stand on the shell of the great space turtle, Great Aetain. So this in <laughs> itself is a nod I... to for the problem of infinite regress. What's infinite regress? Can you explain that? So it's basically the idea that you have turtles all... The, so the phrase for it is turtles all the way down. And it's basically like you reach a point where you're like explaining something and you can't go further down to a basic thing. Yes. So, well, matter is a bit like that, isn't it? You keep on, <laughs> we keep on finding smaller and smaller bits of matter until we get to the point where we don't know whether it's a particle or a wave or it's both, that kind of thing. That's a little bit infinite regression, isn't it? Yep, it totally is. And that's kind of, um, well, it's interesting because this idea of a world turtle is in a bunch of different cultures and the concept of turtles all the way down has been used to explain uh, or, like, you know, casually explain scientific ex um, theories like that. So it works out pretty well. <laughs> it's funny, everything's connected. Um, so because the disc is <clears throat> disc-shaped, you might have got that, rather than um, rather than sphere-shaped, like, shaped like our own home planet, instead of having a core, which we have, it has a hub, right, like a wheel that it turns on. And while our core is an alloy of mostly nickel and iron, which gives us Earth's magnetic field, the disk's hub is made of octiron, the elements of magic. So this, combined with the rotation of the disk, which has one full rotation every 800 disk days, means that the disk has a magic field rather than a magnetic one. And this means that magic becomes a kind of field like physics that can be studied and used. And that's sort of where we come in in the first book of Terry Pratchett's Discworld series, The Colour of Magic. A magic field. Beyond Discworld, I assume there's a sun that the Discworld yes. revolves around? No, entertainingly no? enough, the sun, the disc has a sunlit. So the sun revolves around the disc. 
So the disc world is more massive than its nearest star. Or do we need to put aside ideas about stars and planets in the world of Terry well, Pratchett, the physical world of Terry Pratchett? Well, no, because they're quite obliquely hinted at. So he'll constantly say the disc is a ridiculous planet. There's a lot of um, a lot of sort of inside jokes made about that, a lot of illusions and nudging and giggling. But basically the idea is that Discworld is a vehicle to kind of parody and make fun of a lot of aspects of our own world and also of a lot of ideas that people used to have. For example, like the Earth being the centre of the solar system. Yes, and, and the um, Earth being flat. That's another one, isn't it? Yeah, and that's gaining some popularity again. It's becoming fashionable, isn't it? <laughs> well, I hope it's not fashionable, but I guess it depends on what <laughs> circles in which you in which you um you revolve, so to speak. One of the interesting things about Terry Pratchett is that he actually wanted to be, I believe, an astrophysicist and then basically discovered that he couldn't hack the math. So he had this he retained this intense interest in all kinds of scientific ideas and all kinds of technical ideas as well. So when you read the Discworld series, you come across all of these things that work really well as analogues for a bunch of different things that we actually interact with every day. I first kind of started reading the Discworld series when I was a kid, when I was seven. But rereading it recently, I come across all of these things. I'm like, oh, that's like, that's a good stand-in for this concept that we have here on Earth. So basically... Octiron can be viewed as an elect well, octiron and the magical field can be viewed as like an analogy for electromagnetism. Starting off with the hub of the disc being made from octiron, and just as our core is nickel and iron. So fundamentally, you're establishing magic as like a, a kind of physics on this planet. And then um, if you look at Earth the core and Earth's rotation are actually responsible for Earth's magnetic field due to induction. So basically due to the movement of um, currents in the kind of molten outside of the core of Earth, we get our magnetic field. And that protects us from things like the sun's radiation. It um, prevents our atmosphere from floating away. Getting back to Terry Pratchett's disc world, though, Octiron, mm-hmm. does it exist only at the hub of his disc? No. So similarly to um, iron and nickel existing also as like sort of deposits, you know, mineral deposits around the place, um, octiron does the same thing. And that's where it becomes a little bit interesting because it's not only an analogue for um, electromagnetism, it's also an analogue for radioactivity. But if we stick with the electromagnetism for a second... Let's say that you can mine octiron, right? You can mine it on the disc. So what ends up happening is you get these objects that you can smell, that you can make from octiron. So these are inherently magical, right? Just like iron is inherently magnetic. So an interesting thing here is that if you have a magical object, it interacts with the magical field of the disc. And then that produces its own smaller magical field. So just like um if you have a magnet it's it has its own magnet well magnetic field right if you um start up something electrical it has its own magnetic field and then if you put iron um if you have like wires wound around iron right and you pass electricity through them then that creates magnetic field the iron responds to it and the same thing happens with these magical objects how in Terry Pratchett's world, is the magical field utilised? Funnily enough, he does a book on uh, universities and, a no- well, a number of series that kind of hover around the universities and then one dedicated book. So one of the things that we get to see is wizards doing all sorts of experiments with the magical field and they allude to um, crude magic items like magical fields, I mean magic swords, which create... Uh, what are described as unsuppressed harmonics on the astral plane that play hell with any delicate experiments in applied sorcery for miles around. (laughs) So um, this is kind of similar to the way you need to shield electrical equipment when you're working with signals, because otherwise your signal ends up affected. So you need to use electromagnetic interference shielding when you're um, working with any of these signals. 
if you look at a printed circuit board, for example, you'll see that they have like strategically placed uh, metal sheets if you were to like peel one apart. And that's basically to um, prevent all those sensitive little components from messing with each other. If you're on the disc, if you're closer to the hub, is there more mm -hmm. magical potential? No. Basically, if you're closer to the rim, you kind of experience it more because you're out on the edge of it. And if you have like this spinning object, you know how things, they have to move faster yes. on the outside of a circle than on the inside? That's right. It's kind of like that. The magical field builds up on the outside of the um, of the disc, on the rim, which luckily very few people, handily enough, live on the rim. So they don't get too badly affected by this. But it does mean that there's um, a little island close enough to the rim where they have um, a lot of really powerful sorcerers because they've got all of this sort of raw material around them. And wizards and sorcerers and people who, who are practitioners of magic still need what things made of octiron. Yeah, so there's, um, there's a concept in chemistry, and I've forgotten what it's called, um, but it's basically that that any any way that something is completed, the same any path for a reaction, the same amount of energy will be used if you reach the same end result. So if you start at point A and you end at point B, whatever kind of route your reaction takes, it'll take the same amount of energy. And so um, the same thing applies with magic in Terry Pratchett's universe, which is that if you're doing something by magic, it takes the same amount of energy as if you were to physically do it by some other means, right? And so that's kind of why wizards rely on octiron a bit for like, um, for that energy. It's an energy source, essentially. You've talked quite a lot about the um, analogy <laughs> between octiron and electromagnetism, but what about octiron and radioactivity? I have one real quick thing to say about electromagnetism before I move on. I promise. Oh, yep, yep, yep. So one of my, uh, one of my favorite things, which I only just realized on rereading recently, was that solar panels actually end up being referenced. So one of the things that the disk's magical field does, kind of similar to our own, you know, electromagnetic and gravity and gravitational fields, is it like interferes with the way that light travels on the disk. So from the sun onto the disk. And the magical field is described as slowing down the passage of light so that it can be, uh, you know, it can reach the disk. And then there's a civilization that's made light reservoirs that are made out of silica. And this means that they can like trap the light. So that I just thought that was like a handy little nod to, um, to solar panels, which, you know, the most common ones, particularly in 1983, were made out of silicon. And radioactivity. Much like radioactive material on our own planet, large deposits of octiron lead to really interesting effects. For example, one of the continents on the disk is known as the counterweight continent due to its high density. And if you think about radioactive elements, we know they're really heavy, right? They're at the end of the periodic table. Yep. After lead, things start to get really interesting. So being the counterweight continent, that kind of gives a clue as to what you might find there. And this means it balances out the other larger continents, because if you remember, it's all, it, the disk is flat on a hub. It has to be balanced to spin. So the counterweight con continent's landmass is mostly composed of octiron, and the influence of the octiron can be seen in the casual magical items that you get there. So the magic basically seeps out and affects objects. It's like shedding. Um, if you have octiron around, it sheds some of its magic. So that's similar to how if you have a radioactive material, it's shedding alpha particles, beta radiation, gamma radiation. This just got me thinking, is octiron an element? Yes. So if it's shedding magic, if it's shedding that as in, say, a radioactive substance like uranium, then does it become some other element as it breaks down? No, but you get something called denatured octiron. The interesting thing there is that, it, handily enough, it becomes impervious to magical radiation. You know, that would be really handy if, if uranium, for example, 
<laughs> like this doesn't happen on their own planet as far as I know and potentially as far as any human being knows but it w- wouldn't it be lovely if uranium at some point um, got down to the stable form that in turn wasn't affected by radioactivity and we could then use it as a um you know as a shield don't we but use then, don't I, we use lead to some extent to do that and it isn't that's that one exact, of the things that that's uranium exactly breaks what down I was to just thinking yeah that's actually exactly what I was just thinking. I'm like, oh, wait, no, no, it does. You're right. So in this case, octiron is an element and it doesn't change into other elements the way that uranium does, but um, it becomes this thing called denatured octiron. So that's interesting too. And that's something I didn't notice. Well done. What about the influence of gravity? Is there gravity? Is that what holds this world together? No. So the power of narrative, this is so handy, isn't it, for a science fiction, well, fantasy writer um no the power of narrative is what holds it together and that's explained by another element called narrativium which is uh not as well explained as octiron and just sort of thrown out there but basically in the disc world instead of having a well-behaved gravitational field gravity works because it has to because people expect it to essentially (laughs) it fits the narrative and therefore it is which is now yes, getting, that's exactly. getting a bit quantum on it, isn't it? I mean, something is is or isn't until you see it and then it is or it isn't. But otherwise it's both. Absolutely. Yeah. One of the things that I'm thinking about, listening to you talking about Terry Pratchett and your own work, which also sounds fascinating, as I said at the start, which is, which is optical <laughs> nano micro robotics, which sounds like, nice. well, for a start, can you tell me just briefly what that is? So what I do is I take an ultraviolet laser and basically what happens is this laser, which is itself very focused, then gets further focused by putting it through a bunch of lenses. And this means that you get a really high concentration of um, photons in one place. And what can happen then is if you have like a blob of some sort of um, photo resin, right? that'll only um, polymerize, it'll only link up and harden if it gets exposed to a high enough concentration of energy. Because you're putting a really high concentration of energy into a very tiny volume, you can 3D print using this laser. And you can 3D print, yeah, and you're talking about micro-robotics. So you're talking about what robots at a very, very small scale, right? Yes, an extremely tiny scale. So the largest dimension of my robots is uh, 30 micrometers. So that's a lot thinner than a human hair. Okay. This seems extraordinary. And this is where I'm getting at, and that what you're dealing with seems so fantastical. Do you actually find somebody like Terry Pratch with all his amazing analogies and balmy theories that make sense in the universe he created useful in terms of your thinking, in terms of creating solutions? Because you have to use your imagination, don't you, to find possible solutions to the problems you deal with? I mean, you absolutely do, because if you've been foolish enough to embark on scientific research, well, (laughs) that might sound ridiculous, but like if you've been, you know... um, stubborn enough to embark on scientific research, what you're basically doing is saying that you can solve a problem that other people haven't managed to yet, or a problem that nobody else thinks is a problem. And so you have to be creative just because there isn't a clear guideline to follow. And because I started reading the Discworld series so young, it's absolutely definitely had an effect on me and like the way I think. So it's it's definitely on a subconscious level even if not a conscious one, affected me. And I really enjoy reading it and finding these like analogies for scientific concepts that I've come across that I'm like, you know, semi-familiar with. Where would we use really, really, really small robots? So the project that I'm working on at the moment is using them to stretch molecules. And to do that, I have to use another laser that's extremely uh, focused. And you know what you mentioned at the beginning, is light a particle, is it a wave? If we just accept for a moment that light carries momentum, whether it's a particle or a wave, it can hit something and make it move. Then if you have a high concentration of photons, 
moving through a space and you have like an object that'll act as a lens, then as they move through that object, they're imparting momentum on the object, right? And so if you move that laser, you can move the object around. So my little robots are not only made using lasers, but they're also controlled using them. And so what I can then do is attach a strand of something like DNA, for example, is what I'm working with at the moment. And I can like move it. I can tether it in, a, in one position and move the other end just so I apply an extremely tiny force on it and look at how the DNA reacts to that how it, you know, stretches out and then relaxes. Why are you stretching molecules? <laughs> oh, honestly, can I tell you jokes? Um, so one of the things that you can do there is you can use DNA to kind of calibrate your tools. So when you're working on such a tiny scale, your uncertainties become relatively large, you know? Um, it becomes harder and harder to know exactly what kind of forces you're applying. The great thing about DNA is that thanks to, you know, a technology like CRISPR, which was recently, you know, the scientists working with that were recently awarded the Nobel Prize in chemistry, you can synthesize DNA strands that are exactly the same as each other, you know, like completely identical. And so if you stretch those strands and they all show you the same response, the same kind of like force extension curve, then you know exactly what kind of force you're applying. That's one reason that you want to stretch DNA. And that's kind of the engineering reason. And as an engineer, that's what I'm interested in. But the other reason, and this is kind of the like biophysics, biomedical side of it, is that if you then look at how DNA mutates, you can look at the effect of those mutations on its mechanical properties. And because cellular processes are controlled by mechanical force, essentially, well, a lot of them are, pressure of cells on each other uh, tells the cells to, uh, you know, produce a certain chemical and activate certain enzymes. So if you then have a mutation in DNA and you apply the force that you know is supposed to activate, say, for example, helicase is supposed to unzip that DNA, and there's a certain mutation that stops that from happening or means that it happens at the wrong time, and then you get a better idea of what kind of like how DNA mutations are occurring and what kind of effects they're having on organisms as a whole. Well, Kate, so, th this sounds like yeah. <laughs> work that is heading in the direction of, of a treatment of cancer. And here's a wild stab from me, maybe even trying to deal with the effects of ageing. Yes, um, there is a lot of uh, research that's been done in, you know, the effects of ageing in uh, using optical tweezers to kind of apply not only uh, light radiation to look at uh, kind of accelerated aging, but also just to look at how, you know, mutations build up, how older molecules react to the same stimulus. Thanks for listening to this episode of Sci-Fi Sci-Fact, hosted by me, Brian Crump, produced by Andrew Robertson, and of course, made possible thanks to the incredible knowledge of those brilliant scientists at the McDiarmid Institute. You can find more episodes of Sci-Fi Sci-Fact on the RNZ Podcast page. RNZ's podcasts are also available on Apple Podcasts, Spotify and iHeartRadio, or pretty much wherever you find your podcasts. And make sure to follow us so you don't miss out on any new episodes. <laughs>